It's a wonderful Friday morning and you are welcome once again to our Living in the Digital World program series. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you are joining us from. My name is Estella Hilda Anaman, and I'm the coordinator for the American Corner Abuba, and I'll be your moderator for this session. So about American Spaces, we provide access to current and reliable information about the United States through book collections, internet access, events, and activities for everyone. Today, we are discussing a very, very insightful for topic and it's ethical journalism in the age of misinformation. And facilitating this session is Efo Kweku Mauto. He's a managing director for EKM Communications Consulting and media coordinator for Institute of Directors Ghana. So Efo Kweku Mauto is a public relations enthusiast. He has worked in various technician roles in different organizations. In 2018, he was the personal assistant to the CEO of a commensal consultant working from the premium office in Accra. He was also a project executive planning and exec executing the Touch Bearers Network and the Speakers Bureau Africa. He has a BA in communication studies and holds a Master of Arts in Journalism from the Ghana Institute of Journalism, where he's currently pursuing a master's program in journalism. His vision is to avail his experience, knowledge, and expertise to facilitate and promote any project, program, organization that works with it. So during the session, please do well to type all your comments or questions in the comment box below and they'll be well addressed. Thank you so much for staying with us. And now I'll hand it over to Efo Kweko Mauta. Thank you. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. As Estella said, my name is Efu Koku Mauto. In other spheres, you can also call me Theodore. Um, Estella, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, that was a nice profile of mine, but I think we need to update the profile. So since the last time we used this profile, I have actually finished my master's degree program in journalism at the Ghana Institute of Journalism. So we need to update that. I'm no more pursuing the masters. I'm done with the masters. Um, <clears throat> it's always an excitement to come and share thought with you on journalism, on media information literacy, on digital literacy, on internet governance. Uh, in the little I do regarding advocacy, these are the stuff that I often interact with. So I'm excited today to talk about a very important topic, one that all of us need to take note of, which is ethical journalism in the age of misinformation. There's so much misinformation these days. There's so much happening that we all need to take note of. And so it is important for us to understand where does ethical journalism lie when we have this prevalence of misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation in our system. And so we want to find out how we can navigate the challenges of reporting truthfully, despite the times that we find ourselves in. As always, I'm grateful to the US Embassy Ghana, to Mobile Web uh, Ghana for the opportunity to facilitate or be a part of such uh, very important conversations in the digital series. But before we delve in, ladies and gentlemen, I just want you to put in the comment section quickly. This is uh, on on this is a picture, two pictures of two different people. Uh, on my left, which would be I think your left as well, depending on what you are watching on. Um, the gentleman is called Kojo Sheldon. Kojo Sheldon is a blogger, is a content creator, a digital content creator. He has a website where he puts some news on, but he's most popular on YouTube and Twitter as a content creator in Ghana. On the right is Bernard Koku Avle. Bernard Koku Avle is the managing, uh, yes, manager, general manager at City FM City TV. He's uh, the host of their popular breakfast show, which has got so many awards uh, locally and internationally. He's my favorite journalist. Is my my role model, if you so wish. Now the question I'm asking the of these two gentlemen is, 
if there was a breaking news today, which of these two gentlemen would you believe the most? Just put your comments or your submissions in the comment section. Uh, Estella and the media team, Andrew, would help us to read some of the comments. But that is what I want us to, to, to deliberate on this morning or this evening or this uh, afternoon, wherever you're watching from. Journalism today is completely different from the journalism I knew when I was growing up. When I wasn't a, a media practitioner and I was just an audience to the media, journalism was ethical, was uh, rigorous. Journalism would scrutinize information before putting it out. Um, I rarely heard about people apologizing on the media for something they put out. But today, journalism is completely different. As, as a practitioner, I'm looking at colleagues, I'm looking at industry players, put out a lot of information and two minutes later come up to apologize, put out a lot of information and at the end of the, the day, come out to tell us they didn't know it was wrong information. So it's, it's completely different from what it used to be. And the question always is, what has changed and how do journalists stay true to the principles of the industry despite all the challenges that we have? So in this short discussion, we're going to look at these very important uh, guidelines or issues. We're going to have a look at impact of misinformation. Then we'll also discuss the ethical principles that are needed in journalism. We'll also look at the challenges that journalists face, most especially in Ghana, but generally all over the world. It's the same challenges if you really look at it. And then we'll look at fact checking and verification as important tools in in surviving as a, an ethical journalist in this day of misinformation. We also look at balancing speed with accuracy. We'll look at combating confirmation bias and then building trust with the audience. And of course, we'll look at some organizations and individuals that are doing amazing stuff in the space of ethical journalism or ethical reporting, and then we will end. So what is ethical journalism? Ethical journalism is simply principled, truthful, and responsible news reporting. You know, journalism is a gathering of information, processing or receiving that information, and distributing or disseminating that information to the audience. Now, journalism is very important because it is based on journalism that individuals, organizations, and the society at large form perceptions and make informed decisions. So without journalism, it's difficult to make informed decisions. Without journalism, it's difficult to form the right or the appropriate perceptions about individuals, organizations, and places. And so it is important, therefore, for us to have ethical journalism in, 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 our, in, in our world, in our society. And ethical journalism is, has to be principled. It means that as an individual, you have to be principled. There are principles of journalism that we need to take note of as uh, journalists and as even audiences to, to, to news. There is also truthful information, right? Truthful information means that it's been verified, we, can, we have checked it, we have cross-checked it, and we know that, and we know that it is uh, confirmed by the people that uh, put it out. So we can say that this is truthful or this is accurate. It is also responsible journalism or responsible news reporting because it's not just about putting out the information or the right information. It's also about measuring the and putting out has a certain positive impact on the people. And so you, you put out must be and what its its needs and what it's it deserves or what is important for the society to grow. Then we have why then is ethical journalism or ethical reporting important? Ethical reporting is important because it builds democracy. It is a foundation for democracy. And that is why I am always excited to be part of the digital series because um, the United States being the 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 the, the if you so wish 
the umbrella, right? The billboard of uh, democracy in the world and Ghana being the billboard of democracy in Africa, always partnering to put out such solid content about digital literacy is something that is exciting. And, and that is why it's important for us to even look at this topic, right? Ethical reporting is critical. It is, is a bedrock of democracy. There cannot be a proper democracy if there is not enough information. And if to have information or enough information, we need ethical reporting because putting out just any kind of information actually undermines democracy. So in today's world, we find a lot of information, but all this information that we find, the question is how much are they contributing to building and sustaining our democracy? Also, ethical reporting is important because it leads, as I said earlier on, to informed decision-making. Individuals cannot make proper decisions if there is not ethical reporting. For instance, it is difficult for people to know who to vote for if they don't have the right information about the people participating in the election, right? And so if you have issues where there is misinformation or disinformation about who is putting out, who is participating in an election, who is even putting out the right information regarding their campaign, at the end of the day, audiences or electorate might end up voting the, right, the wrong person or the person they may not have liked all because of the kind of information that was put out. And that is why in this discussion, we must take note of the, the prevalence or the popularity of misinformation, right? Um, misinformation is popular today because of rapid creation. Like it is, it is easier today to create information than it has ever been in, 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 in the history of the human race. You can just buy clicking a few buttons or touching a few parts of your screen, create information and put it out. Just by putting something on your status, on your WhatsApp status, you can create misinformation. It is also very easy today to distribute information. And that is also leading to the popularity of misinformation, right? And it's also very easy to manipulate misinformation. Okay, and that is one of the reasons why it is, yeah, misinformation is popular today and and you see all of this rapid creation of mis, of information distribution of mis, uh, of information manipulation of information all of this i call social media because of social media today it is more it is easier for misinformation to thrive because social media is it has no editorial gateway Social media has no ownership. Social media has, has freedom of space. And you see, all these are very important for us to have, um, to enjoy freedom of information. But all these also allow for misinformation to thrive and to become popular. So what is the impact then? How does it affect society, right? Um, the impact of misinformation is, is what it is because of social media, like I mentioned on, early on. But see, social media does not on its own um, lead to or promote misinformation. Social media on its uh, own does not create, if you so wish, misinformation. Like I always say, social media is like a gun. It is useless except in the hands of a human being. And so it's uh, somebody who decides to do something with it. And in this day and age, we have... Uh, all these algorithmic uh, softwares or algorithmic AIs, artificial info, uh, intelligence, right? Which lead individuals to just access certain kinds of information based on their, their choices. And so you are always bombarded with only what, or with mostly what you, you, you interact with, the things you like on social media, the things you, <clears throat> sorry, the things you, you engage with, these are the information or things that you always would find yourself receiving information on. Um, in, in class last semester when I was teaching uh, media, culture, and society to my students, I asked them a question. I asked them whether they realize or why they think the moment you, you interact with something on one social media platforms. When you, you get another social media platform, you often find yourself 
seeing ads uh, or seeing content that is related to the thing that you just interacted with. For instance, you can engage with something even on WhatsApp. And the moment you get on Facebook, you have content relating to that um, issue or that thing that you interacted with even on WhatsApp. So that is as a result of the algorithms that are built into these social media platforms and how these algorithms identify what you like and, and find a way to put those things out. Then there are the malicious actors, the individuals who just decide to create misinformation. I, I mean, in, in the 2020, 2016 uh, US elections, we heard about, and there are so many documentaries that have um, explored how individuals in Russia and other part of the world came to sit here in Ghana and just intentionally put out misinformation and disinformation about the US elections just to promote one candidate above the other candidates. In the 2016 elections, this was a huge issue. And these individuals are one of the reasons why misinformation is so impactful on journalism. Then there is the echo chambers. Echo chambers are spaces, whether online or even offline, where people generally find information that agrees with what they want or what they believe in. So if I'm a Christian and I engage with only Christian content, I would always find people agreeing with what I put out. If I'm a Muslim, I always find people agreeing with what I put out. So anytime you, you write something on your social media, more than 90% of the people who engage with the content would agree with you. A few would disagree. And that agreement, that cycle of finding people agreeing with your content is called the echo chamber. And that is one of the reasons why misinformation is so popular or so impactful. And then, of course, one of the things that makes misinformation so big is the inadequate fact checking that we have. We don't have enough fact checking. And where we even have fact checking, the bigger problem is that there's not as many or as much of it as compared to the misinformation out there. In fact, the, the research has shown that misinformation travels faster than fact-checked information. And even when you fact-check information and you put it out, it does not get the same traction as the misinformation you just fact-checked got. And that is a huge problem. So how do all of these affect our society? What are the consequences on the economy? What are the consequences on our democracy? First of all, of course, there's the issue of public health. And you know, especially since COVID-19, we have come to appreciate the, the place of public health information or public health communication or public health media. And so when we have all these misinformation, it affects the public health in, in the society that the misinformation exists. And we found it in COVID-19 and how people put out various weird information. People said you can literally drink raw, raw grounded pepper just to get rid of mis the, the, the COVID virus. People said you can drink uh, alcohol. My, I, I said this in, in, in my last uh, digital series that my father decided to take more alcohol during the 2020 lockdown because he had been told on radio, radio that if he took more alcohol, the, the 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 alcohol will kill the COVID virus in his system. And the, the analogy or the logic is that if alcohol is used to make hand sanitizers, and if alcohol-based hand sanitizers are what you need to, to, to disinfect yourself from the virus, then it is even better <laughs> to drink the alcohol directly. And my father was drinking what we call here, yeah, what, what in the US and other parts of the world they will call spirit. In Ghana, we call it apoteshi, raw alcohol. And that was what he was drinking. So misinformation has huge consequences on public health. Now, misinformation also has, has consequences on election and, and democracy. Like I mentioned earlier on, elections have been interfered with, uh, people have been elected that the countries that the elections happened in were very angry. In, in, in Nigeria, in their last election, it happened just this year. The, the youth were very angry because they thought the person who became president was not the person they voted for. But the question is, what happened? What information did they get? Did people actually vote as much as they were making the noise on social media? Or was it just social media noise? Did people vote for the person they thought they were voting for? Or they voted for the person they wanted to vote for? All these are questions that arise when issues of election interference happen. 
And you can always link it to misinformation regarding elections. There's also social polarization. The more we live in echo chambers and the more we are fed with uh, um, information that agrees with what we believe in through the algorithms, we, we end up dividing our society into two or into divisions, if you so wish, where it is us against them, it is us versus them. And I was saying early on, even before we came online, that in Ghana yesterday, we saw something like that because of the demonstrations happening in Ghana uh, regarding the economy and how the police are uh, brutalizing the people that are involved in the in the um in the demonstration on social media the conversation is us versus them it's like the police and the government have teamed up against the society but there are police people who are helping and there are government people or even politicians who are concerned by the same system by the same demonstration but the information on social media is the demonstrators against the, 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 how do you call it? The police and the government, right? And so misinformation leads to social polarization. Then of course, that's what the economic damage is. So many researches, so much information out there about how much these um, information uh, damages so So to speak, have uh, all misinformation affected our economy. So much money being lost, almost. But what I am so much concerned about, what I think is more critical to our conversation today, is the erosion of trust in the media, which is an effect or a consequence of misinformation. Today, people do not trust the media anymore. So much research has been done by the Reporters Without Borders. Uh, by Reuters, by other uh, agencies, research firms that have confirmed that more people distrust the media today than ever in the history of the human race. The funny thing is there is more information today than has ever been. But in the midst of all this information, there is also less trust for the media than has ever been. And that is what we must take note of. Because if people don't trust the media, then it means people are not getting the right information because even the social media that they resort to does not also have the right information for them. So in the end, it is very dangerous for, uh, for building democracy, for building the economy, for creating uh, unity among people, for building the health of our, our nation. And so ethical journalism is important. So what are the principles of ethical journalism? Why, what are the things to consider in, in, in rebuilding trust of the people in the media and sort of averting the consequences of misinformation on our society? First and foremost, truth and accuracy. It was Brian McNair who defined um, um, news as any altered text that posits itself to be an accurate and truthful account of a hitherto unknown fact. In other words, journalism's, journalism's job is to bring out truth and accurate or truthful and accurate information so of something that was not known. All right? So it is very, very important an ethical principle for journalists to consider truth and accuracy. Another ethical principle that is very important to consider is accountability and transparency. Now, accountability is important, but the question is who are you accountable to? It is um, Kovach and Rosenstiel in their book on the elements of journalism. They mentioned that journalism's obligation is to the truth and journalism's, uh, um, how do you call it? Journalism's, we are accountable. Journalism is accountable to the society, right? Every journalist must understand that we are employed by the society first of all, and so we are accountable to the society. Our first boss, as a journalist, your first boss, your first CEO, your first owner is the society, all right? In, in another discussion, I could have gone all the way to discuss how society created 
media and journalism to be the information mongers of, of, of the society. And so it's important to be transparent with the society, to be transparent with the information we put out. If you are finding difficulty with the information you are putting out, let the audience know. If you didn't contact the, the other person involved in the news, let the audience know. Don't put out information and make it look as though you did all the work that needs to be done. So accountability and transparency are critical to ethical journalism. Another principle that is critical to ethical journalism is independence and impartiality. While we understand that we are owned by the society, we also agree that individuals, members of the society, build or establish media organizations. And so we must maintain an independence from those to report on. We must maintain an independence from those that we report on. It means that journalists cannot go and be collecting money from politicians, cannot go and be collecting money from businessmen, cannot go and be collecting money from popular uh, um, uh, what do you call it, artists and musicians and actors, because these are the people we report on, and these are the people who put out information that affect the society, and so we must maintain an independence from them. But the most important persons we must maintain an independence from, in addition to all these that I've mentioned, are the owners of the media houses. Also, we must be impartial, we must be balanced in whatever reporting that we put out. So truth and accuracy, Accountability and transparency, independence and impartiality, these are the major principles of ethical journalism. But there are challenges. There are real time, genuine challenges to practicing ethical journalism. And one of those challenges is the time pressure. In fact, media exists in time and media makes media thrives or media media only exists because of time and the truth of the matter is that there is so much information to put out but there's so little time or so little airspace or air time to put this out and so we we'll live in this cycle of 24 7 news that at every point in time you must put something out but while we live in all of that that not all the time not all the 24 hours and seven days a week is allotted to news or is allotted to information. There is time for discussion shows, there is time for ad adverts to be played, there is time for entertaining content like movies and music to be played. And so journalists in actual fact have just a, a, a subset or a, a, a fraction, if you so wish, of the time that the media has. So media is 24 seven, but journalists don't have the 24 seven. We live in a time pressure where you are always under pressure to put the information out. Aside from that, you, are, you also don't have all the time to relax and write the information the way it should be done. All right, there's also social media. Social media is a huge challenge. And I think we've mentioned this early on, so I'll not even dwell on it. But the other part of the pressure or the challenge that journalists face is the broke life. What I choose to call the broke life. But essentially what I'm talking about is remuneration. Who pays the piper calls the tune is what they say, right? So journalists are not paid by the society. Journalists are paid by the owners of the media houses. So these owners have influence on the journalists and what they put out. But those owners themselves are, are either politicians or they are business people. And so they too, are looking for profit for their organizations or for their political interest. So what do they do? If it's a politic, if, if the owner of the media house is not a politician or a media or a business person, then this person is looking for adverts from either the politicians or the business person. And so you find that at the end of the day, the journalist is at the bottom working for the, the society, but in actual fact, working under the owner. And the owner is either working for their business interest or their political interest or for their advertorial interest. So at the end of the day, the journalist doesn't get paid well. The journalist needs money to move around. So the journalist will succumb to collecting money from either the owner of the media house or the politicians that they report on, or the business people that they report on, or the, 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 the influencers that they report on. So in the end, the journalist is broke, 
And so he's forced to put out certain kinds of information that they may ordinarily not put out. So what do we do? What can journalists do in the face of all these challenges, in the face of the quantum of misinformation that is out there, in the face of the knowledge of the ethical principles that are critical to journalism, and in the face of the understanding that journalism is the most crucial element of the society based on which we build our democracy and sustain the democracy that we've built and even help the audiences or the members of the society to make informed decisions or informed choices. What do we do? Put your comments in the, in the your, your submissions in the comment section of what you think journalists can do in the age of misinformation. What do you think we can do? And here is where I pause and go back to Estella and find out. Estella, early on, I asked a question regarding these two um, persons. Did anybody yes. give us any uh, yeah. comments in the comments uh, session? Yes, yes, yes. Um, we have interesting comments from our participants. So from Reverend David Darko Ado, he said he will listen to City TV. That means he will go with Bernard. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, I can hear you clearly. Okay, yes. And then we have Espoir. He also said he'll go with Bernard. And <laughs> Espoir will definitely we, go with Bernard. I mean, that's the, yes, and then and then Mousy also said that he 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 will believe Bernard, yes. So those are the comments we have so far regarding that particular question you asked. Stop, stop. Thank you, Rev. Thank you, Espoir. Thank you, Mousy. Um, but when it comes to information about entertainment and the entertainment industry, you might not get the right information from Bernard. You understand? Because Bernard is not an expert in that space. But despite that, notwithstanding, Bernard is more astute, credible a journalist than um, Kojo Sheldon. In fact, in fact, Kojo Sheldon is not a journalist. Let me repeat that. Kojo Sheldon is not a journalist. He is a content creator. And there's a huge difference. And this is where I pause to say a big, big thank you to uh, American Embassy Ghana and, and Mobile Web Ghana. Estella and the team, um, you guys are doing an amazing job. The training you gave to the young lads from GIJ and other institutions uh, who are interested in journalism and, and communication, that, that is very relevant if, uh, training that you gave to them because it is about time we get our journalists to become ethical content creators. It is about time that journalists be able to create content and create it well so that we don't leave content creation to individuals who are not journalists and so do not understand the ethical principles of journalism. But we can have journalists who understand the ethical principles of journalism, who are then creating the same entertaining and relevant content that a society needs. Because truth be told, today, people live on social media. And if people have become netizens, it means they get their news from the net. And if they are getting their news from the net, we cannot leave ethical journalism, addition to traditional media, onto social media. So thank you guys for all that. And so the next one for us to, to deliberate on, and please put your, your comments in the comment section. Uh, what do we do with all the challenges, with the knowledge we've gained and understanding we have about the principles, what do we do? One of the first things we can do is to fact check and verify. It is, it is a non-starter. It is a no-brainer. Fact-checking and verification is a no-brainer. Yes, um, sorry for that short break. So, like I said, fact-checking and, and verification is a no-brainer. You cannot do ethical journalism 
without fact checking. What does fact checking mean? It means you must get, you must scrutinize the information you get from the sources. Every source has their own interest and the interest might be good or bad, but at the end of the day, you must know that interest and you must scrutinize that interest. You must not reduce information to he said, she said. You must also go to experts. Like the, the popularity of the information we have in this country when it comes from when it comes to news and journalism is Akufado said this and Mahama responded that. That is not journalism. And that is not ethical journalism. Yes, it is balanced because you are talking to both sides, but you are only creating polarity. You are only creating division. You are only creating an, a, a they versus them instead of giving credible news and information to the audience or to the, to the society. So yes, you must scrutinize the sources. You must also interview experts. If Akufado said this, and uh, John Mahama responded that, what are security experts saying? What are the economists saying? What are the legal brains saying? You must move beyond the newsmakers to look for the expert and talk to them. You must also, as a matter of necessity, cross-reference the information. Well, yes. City said this, Joyce said that, but who else said the same thing? You must cross-reference the information and you must make sure you are using reliable databases, right? It shouldn't always be about the party communicators or the PR people who, who send you some uh, press release or press statement that you put it out. Beyond that, you must go to the Ghana Statistical Services. Depending on where the information is coming from, you must go to databases like the Living Standards Database, or you must go to all these research organizations that exist to give us reliable data. You must fact check and verify. It is a no brainer. If you don't do anything at all as an ethical journalist, you must fact check and verify. Because see, the moment you fact check and you verify your information, you will end up doing so many of the other principles that we'll share in a few minutes. So fact checking and verification as it, for, it is the most important, guys. If you are a journalist, if you want to be a journalist, if you're a content creator or you are growing yourself to become a content creator and you want to do ethical content creation or ethical journalism, you cannot do it without scrutinizing the source of the information, interviewing experts and adding their, their opinions and their, their experts' uh, knowledge to the information. You cannot do it without cross-referencing the information you get with other sources. You cannot do it without using and applying or employing reliable data sources. You cannot do it without these. Very, very important. But beyond that, what else do you do? You need to balance speed with accuracy. Yes, you live in a space of time pressure. And yes, your bosses and your, your editors are on your neck. Give us the news, give us the news. But you cannot throw away accuracy for speed. In fact, this is where I employ or I bring up the, the popular mantra of the, the, the Ghana, what is it? The Metro, uh, those that are in charge of um, road safety, the Ghana Road Safety Commission. They always say speed kills. Speed does not only kill on the streets or on the roads or when it comes to road accident. Speed even kills more when it comes to media and journalism. So you should never, never sacrifice accuracy for speed. Better to be accurate than to be first. It is better for a journalist to be accurate than to be first. That is why the likes of Anas Tarimiya Anas will use months, even a year or two, to investigate an issue before they put the information out. And that is why the likes of Manasseh Azuri would use months. I work uh, with Justice Bedu Consulting and sometimes we, we, we put together news for France 24, BBC, and some other international media platforms. And men, can we take weeks upon weeks to put together a one minute, 30 seconds report or a three minutes report? We, we can go and record three, four weeks of documentary recording just to produce a three minutes um, documentary. 
because that is the standard. You cannot accurate, I mean, you cannot sacrifice accuracy for speed. So you need to balance your speed with accuracy. And how do you do that? You need to resist the temptation to report the story now. You don't have to be the first to report, right? You need to provide transparent sources. You need to be very transparent with your sources. Who are your sources? And you need to also get training, like media houses that are, I wish there are some media houses on this on this discussion who are listening. We, in Ghana especially, uh, I find it very interesting that we do not do in-service training for our journalists. And so once again, thank you to American Embassy and, and the, um, uh, American Corner and Mobile Web Ghana. But in most of the media houses, you rarely see media houses on their own organizing trainings for their journalists. But you see, in this day and age, that information, the, the, the expertise is changing and changing and changing with the twinkle of an, an eye. So you, you must always seek training. If you're a journalist and you are listening or you are watching me, it is important for you to own your own, even if your media house is not providing it, always seek training always seek training get fresh go and take refresher courses uh, there are there are courses from um how do you call it if, if at mobile Web ghana has courses you can take there is this organization pen plus buy that has courses you can take uh, you can go online and do there's facebook and routers uh, mobile journalism course there is digital literacy courses all over the space refresh your mind refresh your expertise Right. Also apply emotional and human intelligence in what you report. This, this speaks to um, the, the issue of responsibility that I mentioned earlier on. Always apply emotional and human intelligence. If I report this story, how much damage will it make? Okay. And comparing the damage to, to the, the damage to cause to the importance or the relevance of the information I want to put out, is it still important for me to put this information out? How do I even put it out so that I report the truth without hurting the, 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 the innocent people that are related to the information, right? How do I report this without damaging the, the people who may be affected but who are not implicit in the, the information? That is very, very important, especially in, in, in investigative journalism. This is a critical question you have to always ask yourself. If I'm going to put some information that I would damage somebody's uh, reputation, how will it affect their children? How will it affect their, their, their spouses? How will it affect their family members, their organization that may not be aware of their individual actions? The action must be reported, but we must apply human and emotional intelligence. What else can we do? We can combat our confirmation biases and we can build trust with the audience. How do we combat our confirmation biases? First of all, identify and mitigate the bias know that you yourself have a bias. As I'm speaking with you, I have a bias. My bias is towards ensuring that you imbibe the ideas of ethical and principled journalism. That is my bias. So I'm sharing information with you that will intentionally skew your mind to accepting and imbibing ethical principles of journalism in the age of misinformation. So everybody has a bias. Your boss at the media house has a bias. Your, you yourself have your own bias. You have your ethical your ethnic bias, you have your racial bias, you have your gender bias. You must know that these biases exist. And yes, they are not wrong biases. They become a problem when they begin to infiltrate the information that you put out. So identify and mitigate your own biases or the biases that are imbibed in the news. It also the people, the sources that you use, they all have their biases. If you are speaking to somebody from the NPP, they have their bias. In this issue of demonstration going on in Ghana, if you are speaking with the, the demonstrators, they have their bias. If you are speaking with the police people, they have their bias. If you are speaking with the government, they have their bias. If you are speaking with the, the opposition party, they have their bias. In the issue of Mobad, um, Mobad untimely demise in, the, in Nigeria, if you're speaking to Malian music, they have their bias. If you are speaking to Mobad's family, they have their bias. If you are speaking to the youth in, in Nigeria, they have their bias. If you are speaking to the health expert, everybody has a bias. So you must know. You must also, because of the biases, seek to include diverse perspectives in the information you put out. Like I said earlier on, experts, 
data sources, all of those things must be added to the information you put out. You must also encourage critical thinking. Don't only put the information out to your audience. Encourage your audience to themselves critically think through what you are putting out or what information they get. Encourage your audience themselves to put out information that helps that they to look for information that they can also verify on their own. Don't let your audiences be just receiving information from you. Tell them to also verify the information and write your news in such a way that the audience can verify for themselves. How do you do that? You do that by including data sources they can also verify. You do that by including expert opinions they can also go and speak to on their own. If you are writing and publishing online, it means that you are also adding backlinks to other places that you got your sources from. So they too can go and read and so that they can also become critical about the information they get, not only from you, but also from other sources. How do you build trust with the audience? Be transparent to the sources. If you got the information from the NPP, say you got it from the NPP. All these deep throat source and deep that source, deep that source. Using it too much affects your you deep process. Why are you the only one who has a deep throat? No, everybody can have deep throat sources. You need to give us sources and you need to be transparent about those. You need to be able to correct and apologize when the need arises. It is not encouraged. You should, as much as possible, not end up correcting and apologizing for information you put out. But if you did put out wrong information, don't be shy, don't be afraid to put out the right information and apologize. What some journalists do is, when they put out wrong information and they realize it is wrong, they only write a new article or a news story that is correct. And they never apologize for the wrong information they put out. That is not fair. Sometimes if it's online, you need to pull down that wrong information, apologize for it, and put out the right information. Then you can build trust with the audience. You need to also engage with the audience, like I mentioned earlier on. You need to let them participate in the news. Kovac and Rosen still in their element of journalism mentioned that one of the important elements is the audience to have a say in the news. And that is why I'm excited about community journalism and citizen journalism, right? The audience must be able to participate in the news. They don't take over the news, but they participate in the production and dissemination of the news. Now, here are a few um, tidbits of how you can maintain accuracy in breaking the news, how you can maintain accuracy in breaking the news. One of the things you can do is ensure you have multiple sources, right? Multiplicity of sourcing always helps in maintaining accuracy because what one person has said can be corroborated or denied by another person, can be corroborated or denied by another person. I always tell people when I'm training them for writing the news, or especially when it comes to writing investigative news, I tell them that, look, I will never put an article, a news article that is investigative. I will never put it out if I don't have minimum five sources, minimum five, and that is my personal censorship my personal principle, right? I'm not putting this news out unless I have five sources. Even in regular news, which is 450 words or 500 words or 600 words, I'm looking for three, four sources before I put the news out because it is important to have multiple sources to corroborate or to deny the information you're getting from one source. Also, attribution is important. Attribute your sources, attribute your information. This comes in when you're talking about the, the data sources. If you got it from Reuters, say you got it from Reuters. If you got it from Reporters Without Borders, say you got it from Reporters Without Borders. If you got it from City News, say you got it from City News. Don't copy City News work. Go and put it on your portal or your own website as if it's yours. It's not yours. It's for City News. You need to report it as such, right? And if you work for City News, don't go and copy from one unknown uh, bloggers website and put it on your website as if it's from it's from city news if it's from city news you must ensure right attribution also you need to take note of avoiding speculation of course if it's not confirmed don't put it out you need to do real-time updates if you are reporting on the news say you are reporting on the news in real time and ensure that you are updating in real time don't preempt what might happen like i saw yesterday on social media some people already preempted there'll be a clash between the police and the and the demonstrators. So it wasn't surprising when we started hearing that there are clashes, right? But you need to preempt. Well, I am at the venue 
and I'm seeing the demonstrators and I'm seeing the police. As of now, there is no clash. When there is a clash, while well, I'm at the venue, I reported early on there was no clash, but now we have a clash. You need to be updating in real time. Then you need editorial oversight. Whether it is live news or it is recorded news or it is written and reported, you need editorial oversight. You need not to talk only with your senior journalists and with your editors in the newsroom. You need also contact other people, other sources that you trust. As a, as a journalist, I have an ethical, um, ethical accountability partner. As an individual, when I write stories that border on people's reputation, when I write stories that border on critical information about the economy, there is somebody I send it to who is not a journalist, who is not a media practitioner, who checks and reads and finds out how he or she feels about this news that I'm about to publish and gives me other things that I should take note of in publication, right? So you need editorial oversight. Then you need ethical guidelines. Apprise yourself with the, um, the, the journalist code by the GJA code, the, the GJA code of ethics. There is also the international code of ethics for journalists. Go and apprise yourself with it. Read about uh, the element of journalism by Kovac and Rosenstiel. Read about uh, ethical journalism by Brian McNair. You know, read, know, apprise yourself with ethical guidelines of journalism. In, in general, apprise yourself with ethics. I think one of the problems with this country and in, with the world at large is ethics. We lack ethics. And because we don't have ethics, we find it difficult to do anything right. So apprise yourself with ethical guidelines, especially with the guideline of golden mean, the guideline that says that you must always seek balance in whatever that you, you put out, whether it is journalistic information or personal information. Also, be cautious of getting information from social media. These days, I find too many journalists just pick from social media. Uh, last time, uh, Sarkodias said by tweeting. Sarkodias' tweet is not enough to report on. You need to speak to Sarkodias himself. You need to speak to his publicist. His publicist. You need to speak with his, his public affairs, his manager. You need to go beyond what Sarkodias has put on social media, right? So be cautious of what you take on social media and put out. Especially in this day and age where we have all these parody accounts and all these um, um, clone accounts, you cannot just take information from social media and put it out. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, pause, reflect before you write. Pause, reflect before you write. This is very, very important. In, if we're talking about just misinformation and disinformation, we would have said pause, reflect before you share. But because this is to journalists and it's about ethical journalism, I'm saying pause, reflect on the information before you write it. All right. So, so what are some of the examples of ethical journalism we can still find in this day and age of misinformation? I just want to share these examples so you know that it is, it is, it is possible. Don't feel like there is no way out. There is a way out. It is possible to do ethical journalism in Ghana. It is possible to do ethical journalism in America. It is possible to do ethical journalism even in Russia. Some people are doing it and you can also do it. One of the examples is Ghana Fact. Ghana Fact is uh, one of the, or I think the only Ghanaian fact check organization that belongs to the international fact checking network. And in 2020, especially they did a lot of work. They, 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 they collaborated with Facebook and they came up with this uh, West African fact check network or something of the sort where they were just fact checking COVID related misinformation uh, and um, how do you call it? election related misinformation in Ghana and in the US prior to the elections in December. And they did an amazing job. You can read most of the article. I worked with them at the time. I We wrote a story about how uh, in 2020, there was this deep fake, poorly done deep fake video about of the 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 EC, the Electoral Commissioner of Ghana, announcing Mahama as a winner of the election when it was actually uh, Akufuado that won that election. So, fact check Ghana. Ghana fact is doing much in that space. There is also fact check Ghana which is a subsidiary of the Media Foundation for West Africa. They've been doing an amazing job, especially when it comes to um, the, what the fourth estate is doing and investigating issues that border on economics, um, 
malfeasance and all of that. Very, very great work that Factor Ghana have been doing in the years. Then there's also Dubawa, our, our beloved friend Dubawa. And, and most of uh, I'm, those of us at, how do you call it, uh, the embassy and, and uh, Mobile Web Ghana, we know what Dubawa has been doing. So I will not even be labor on that. Joy News is, is, is a, a, another organization to watch out for. City Newsroom is another organization to watch out for. So, ladies and gentlemen, this has been the discussion on ethical journalism in the age of misinformation. And we've pretty, pretty much just gone through what uh, ethical journalism should be, what the challenges for journalists are, especially when it comes to the advent of social media, and what journalists can do, even in the age of social media, in order to become ethical reporters or ethical journalists. If there are any questions and submissions, I will take them. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Chef Fukuko Malto. Um, it's been a really great uh, session. So we have a lot of comments from our participants. We are just some few minutes away from wrapping up, but I could just read them through. So we have Eswa mentioned that absolutely he would go for news in the entertainment industry from Kweku Sheldon, as you mentioned earlier. Then you also made a comment. Yes, yes. And then we have, yes, he also made comments on chapter 12 of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana must be fully implemented and actively enforced in order to reduce the influence, influence of businessmen and women, politicians, and those with personal interest. Yes, yeah, and that, they, that would take some time, but it, it's possible. Okay, and so another comment from Florence, she said, minimum five sources, that's a good principle. And also the conversationalist Nana Lexus made a comment, she said, fact checking is very essential. And Irene also hammered on what she said, pause, reflect before you write. Right. So yeah, it's, it's been a really great session and we thank you all for contributing and you know putting your comments in here. We hope you learned a lot, I did. Thank you so much, Efo Koko Mauto, for yeah. such an insightful session. It's always a pleasure to have you here. So, yes, we have to wrap up our time. It's you know, um, very close. So before ending today's program, I want to introduce you to another amazing online resource that you may find helpful. So this is the eLibrary USA. The eLibrary USA is the state of the Ag Digital Library with nine premier electronic databases that include digital newspapers, magazines, journals, and videos and dissertations. So usually this resource is only available to use in person at our, at our American spaces, but with the global pandemic, we are opening up access to this amazing resource. If you are interested, sign up using the link that can be found in the comment section below. So this program was proudly brought to you by the U.S. Embassy Ghana, American Corner Aboba in partnership with Mobile Web Ghana. If you have not subscribed to this channel, please do so, so that anytime we have a session, you can receive a notification. So that concludes our program. Please follow us on YouTube, U.S. Embassy Ghana, for more amazing virtual programs. Thank you all for joining us today. Remember, pause, reflect before you write or share. All right, have a great day.